Okay. Um, I guess we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so my name is Dave Nicholson. Today I'm going to talk about free software and utopia. So this is kind of a big picture talk, right? Like uh, you don't have to have the command line open to try all the suggestions while we go along. You'll be just fine. Uh, it's more of a cerebral type of thing. So uh, that's me on Twitter. I'm also on uh, Fostodon. Uh, if you're on there, I'll help you find me there. Conservancy is also on a different Mastodon server, uh, but I work at the Software Freedom Conservancy, which um, itself is a fairly idealistic organization. We uh, are a fiscal home for about 50 free software projects that are all community-driven, um, bound to the public interest because we're a charitable organization. So, you know, so we think about like kind of like how could the world be all the time, uh, and so you know it's. When I think about like how the world could be, free software definitely comes up. It's uh, we use free software. Uh, well, we use software to have all these conversations online. We use software to keep in touch with family members. We use software to get informed about political issues, um, and we use software when things go badly, like in the wake of a disaster or some kind of like weather event. So it really matters who's in charge of that. I'm sure that's not a hard sell for this room, right? So, uh, so it matters. Um, but if we're going to change the world anyway, like why not build a utopia? Uh, and so that was kind of what I was thinking about. Like, if uh, you know, none of these things are preset. Like. You don't have to have black slides with green text to show that you're like a super elite free software hacker. Like, why can't we have more glitter, right? We could. Not at your house. It's like, but if you want it. Um, so if, like, we could build anything, right? We're, we're talking about changing it all. So your utopia may vary. Like, mine might have more outdoor stuff than yours. Um, you know, maybe you kind of like that minimalist IKEA look. I'm more of like a clutter. We live in a library situation. And that stuff is all totally fine. Um, when I think about utopia, though, like, ooh, you know, like awake at night, like, what should the world be like? I, I hope that we kind of agree on a couple of things, like that it involves like maybe justice and transparency and empowerment so that it's like when I think of the utopia, I hope that some of the things that are common to all of our ideas there don't involve like a large section of the population being kept in the dark and not in control of anything. And then a couple of other people, maybe like four or five large companies like Amazon, being in charge of everything and then just pestering us with ads all day. So that's like not what I think of. But so I hope that we kind of like some kind of personal autonomy some kind of transparency and like, you know, some sort of like control over our lives online might be part of that utopia. So we spend a lot of time talking about replacements for proprietary software. And some of that you have to, like people go to work. You can't just, you know, we were talking about this in the um, speaker room. Like you can't just be like, I recuse myself from the work email server and calendar. Like, cause they're like, that's how we tell you what to do here. <laughs> like, you can't just opt out. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so, so we, it is worthwhile to spend some time talking and thinking about how we can build replacements for proprietary software so that people don't have to use Outlook at work, right? Um, but I don't think it's enough. Like, and it's like, that's like just the tiniest bare corner of what we could be accomplishing and just saying like, oh, we replicated everything that proprietary software offers, but we put it under a different license. Have we won? I don't, I don't know. I mean, that's like, that's progress. And I recognize it's really hard to like re-implement and, uh, you know, re-engineer software to do like really specific things. There are lots of gaps where I'm like, man, calendaring is hard. So like, cause we still don't have a great one. but. It's, um, I don't think that is enough. That isn't what's gonna like fill the room. Like, I don't, how many of you have had to use like a horrible email program at work? All right, about two thirds of the room. Congratulations to the rest of you. Um, but uh, if I said, come on over to free software, we have a almost as good but slightly more frustrating email program for work. <laughs> like, are you, are you packing up and running over? 
No, no. So it's not, it isn't enough. Uh, and, you know, proprietary software isn't perfect. Like, I hear people don't particularly enjoy Outlook anyway, even if it does, uh, you know, have a calendar or whatever. Uh, but it isn't perfect. And that's, that actually gives us, like, a little bit of a toe in, because we could, we could improve, right? Um, like, it is not a beautiful unicorn that, like, oh, just because, like, a large, fancy company is doing it, like, that's the way to do it. And I would, I would like to see us kind of peel some of that back and be like, why does the computer have to ping all day at work or whatever? There's probably more things that we could look at. Um, but some of the obvious ones are, uh, sorry, that was a head, but some of the obvious ones are the, like, massive collection of data and like complete disrespect for the user. So it's not as pretty of a pony as it likes to make itself out to be. One thing they do have that we do not have is money. I don't know if you can tell over the uh, actual glass water containers, um, but this is some kind of open source meeting that is basically on a waterfront property. Can you guys see the beach from here at Libre Planet? No. Um, yeah, I'm sure, like, also not picture it as, like, the sushi bar and, like, the champagne. But, like, so we're never going to compete with proprietary software on money unless someone wins the lottery or we take over Jeff Bezos via some kind of mind melt. But uh, short of those, it's probably illegal, so don't do that. But it's, you know, short of one of those things happening, like, we're going to have to compete on merits. We're not going to be able to buy people into getting with us on free software. So the thing that we could be really great at is empowering folks, mentoring people, being like really like, hey, we're really glad you're here. Like, let me show you the ropes. I want to show you around and introduce you to everybody and help you get things done. Like, we could knock that out of the park for cheap. Not cheap time, but cheap money. I know. <laughs> it's, that, is, that is not nothing, right? So um, the thing is, is that we have like a little bit of a inside outside problem. We're like, come over here, we're building the utopia. And then you get a little closer and you're like, on this mailing list? Whoa, I don't know. Like the inside isn't as much inside as I thought it would be. Like it's, you guys are building the utopia in here, like there's not even a door to show people when they are behaving badly. Like, so we we could we could do a little better on that. Um, I think it's hard for folks that haven't come in and found a good corner yet to believe that we're really trying to build a utopia in here. Um, so when you get to that mailing list, um, it drives people away, and and you might be like, my project's great. That. That may be, and I've, I've worked on some great projects, but uh, we have a lot of other projects that are not doing a great job with new people, and yet new people still arrive on their shores and, uh, and then take that impression of free software away. So, so how do we do that? I want us to like kind of, couple things, like who are we building it for and who are we building it with? So under the who we're building it with, like, you know, it's, Users can be hard, like they come over and they're like, rah, 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 rah. like, I can't find anything. Some of that is because they have been conditioned to be like, I want what I'm paying for. And it's like, you're not paying for this. <laughs> it's like, I want, I want something. Like, uh, and sometimes that's like we haven't given them a good channel for that squawky energy. Um, and sometimes that's like, because we spent time building something over here for like a couple years and then we're like, we brought you a gift. And it's like, oh, you wear a size eight shoe? Gosh, it seems like we should have asked you about that like three years ago or something like that. And it's like, so if users aren't part of the process, then we try to gift them a thing that they don't actually want. Um, my friend Paul Finwick likes to tell this story about uh, some you know, humanitarian-minded folks that made this play pump for, uh, you know, for developing nations uh, to get water. And so uh, the thing is, it was like, oh, it'll be fun. Everyone will want to help 
like operate the pump to get water. Turns out the pump was not fun. You know, it was kind of demeaning for adults, and kids didn't like it. So like now, instead of having like an OK working pump with a couple of broken ones here and there, they had like a demeaning weird toy that you had to use to get water. So like some people somewhere, like they never came down to be like, would you like to have this? Like, would you want this improvement that we've made for you? And they just like went in and installed it. And people were like, uh, could we, we would prefer not to have this. So I want us to kind of feel like, figure out more ways that we can bring in the user earlier on. Um, Cause like, I know if I was gonna go to space, I'd at least want a window, right? Like who, that crew cabin? No one who put this design together is planning to ride in that thing. There's no way. So like, we have to think about like who we're building it for. And we, we can't like imagine other people. We have to go talk to them. So, so in this kind of, how do we talk to new people? So I, uh, we're here in Massachusetts. Welcome to Massachusetts. I did not grow up here. Uh, I grew up in Maryland, which is maybe part of the South, maybe not part of the South. There's actually like an epic edit war on Wikipedia <laughs> about whether or not uh, Maryland is part of the South. Uh, I don't really have a dog in that fight. There's like a lot of weird things. People are like, I eat grits here. It's totally part of the South. Other people are like, you know, well, Mason-Dixon line, OK. Or like, we grow corn. How could we not be part of the South? Or like, look, we got stoplights. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. They have stoplights in the South. That's not a thing. Um, it's a, you know, a little more rural area. It's, you know. So um, yeah, so what Maryland is not is Massachusetts. It's definitely not Massachusetts. So when I first got here, I was like, hi. And my friend was like, you don't do that on the subway. <laughs> so I was like, oh, why not? Well, what about like when we're just waiting in line for stuff? You know, like we're all here. She's like, no, we don't do that here. And I thought, I came around, you know, I was trying to like acclimate. And so I came around to this idea that like Massachusetts folks are they're honest, they're more direct, and that their rudeness is somehow like a virtue. It's like they're not faking it like folks from the South or Maryland. Like they're all nice, but they don't mean it. Hmm. Is that true? I don't think so. Yes and no. There are, there are parts. Um, it, it can actually both be true, that they are polite in Maryland and don't always mean it. Um, and that we don't actually have to be that rude in Massachusetts or free software. Um, <laughs> so now, like, so a thing that I like to do uh, when I am in parts of the city that have tourists in them is I see people looking at their phone and like, what? Because like, you know, we have like kind of this spaghetti street thing happening. And I ask them like, oh, um, do you need help finding something? Because I want to break down the impression that Massachusetts has of being full of jerks. <laughs> it probably doesn't surprise you that I also want to do that for free software. <laughs> so um, it might feel weird at first. <laughs> but I would like us to be nice to new people. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I help run a conference called Seagulls, so I have a lot of photos with seagulls in them. <laughs> and I don't know where we can get these costumes, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get your sizing, Adam, because yeah. I, I, I'm pretty sure they only make them in men's. Um, anyway, so user experience. It's like a place where we, we have like room for improvement. Like Sometimes our software doesn't do what we have promised it will do. And sometimes this is like a mild, like, OK, whatever. And other times, it's really important. Like, if we're trying to say, like, free software is more secure, but then it isn't, like, that's not a good way to bring in new people. Because then you'd be like, well, you know, I mean, like, you don't want to, like, spend all that time uninstalling something. And they're like, no, 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 that's how proprietary software wins, because it can't be uninstalled sometimes. So, you know, we want to make sure the user experience is good. So this is part of that, like, m doing more to connect with who we're building it for. Um, 
Accessibility is really key on this, and there are some projects that do a really great job, like on rears for people with visual impairments, um, and, and it's, it's really good. But there are other projects where it's just like, oh, that's like an unknown category. Like, we don't know how we are on accessibility. And I think this is one of those places where, um, so like a lot of folks with reading or low vision, like they don't have like a lot of money. We don't, you know, so like we could be really great here in serving populations that don't have tons of money and let the proprietary software companies like fight over like, hey, do you need like a application to figure out how to pick out your second boat? It's like, okay, we can let you have that. And then we could focus on serving people who aren't being served. Um, we could also make huge improvements here. Um, and, and I don't mean only us. Like, I'm saying this is an opportunity for us to be like, hey, it's actually better here, as opposed to like that, but with fuzzy fonts. You know, it's, we could be really great at this. Like, so our social networks could give people much more control over how much poop they encounter online, because, um, no one really likes that except the dispenser. So um, I assume they must like it. I haven't, that, I haven't done studies on this. But, um, but this is something we could be really great at and be like, you know, without like a lot of financial output, we could just be like, hey, over here we have a place to look at videos without someone calling like a baby a Nazi in the third comment. Wow, so there's a, that's what they call in the business sense a, a, a market niche. Um, <laughs> so, which is not being filled right now. So we could fill that niche, but not with poop. So, so like, and then who are we building it with? That's the other question that I wanna uh, think about because like we could be good inside and outside. So we tried to do this very intentionally at Media Goblin. Um, we, we spoke, like Chris and I had a lot of conversations like, okay, like we specifically decided whether Media Goblin succeeds or not, it will be a model free software project. We will make people feel welcome here. Uh, we will start with diverse leadership so that we end up with like a diverse contributor community. Um, Chris worked really hard to make sure that the goblins on this site don't look black or white or even most of them don't seem to be gendered. They're all like kind of purple NB goblins, which is awesome because many other softwares that you might look at go way the other direction and it's like, I fit 10 dudes in this photo and they're all white guys in their 20s. Like, huh, like, so we're working to be the opposite of that and let people know like, yeah, we don't have a default setting on what you should look like when you come here. Um, and so, you know, people came, it was really great. I, uh, I wasn't sure if we'd be able to do the video. You can look this one up, but <laughs> it's, he's doing a little whistle and all the raccoons come. <laughs> Um, it's, it's worth watching. Um, but this is, and then we ended up with a really diverse contributor community, which is great. Um, you know, so, so that's important to us. Uh, we also spent a lot of time, like, making sure that we were treating new people, like, really great. Like, people would come by, they would, like, do, like, two, you know, two lines of code, and then they, but they'd be listed in the repo, and we would make sure that they were in the release notes that month but not only coders. So like I had lunch with a friend of mine who was like, I'm a user experience designer. I will go to lunch with you for an hour and a half. I paid for her $7 lunch. She's certainly worth more than $5 an hour. So I put her in our release notes because that was a gift of time. And it helped us really think through a lot of our user experience stuff. So like everyone got thanked for their contributions, whether they were code or not, whether they were new or not, they all got thanked. Uh, and, you know, like I said, non-coders, if you, <laughs> um, I think about this, like, does any, can anyone remember, like, trying to find documentation in, say, the last week for a piece of software and failing to get the answer? Yeah. How about the last month? 
Yeah, okay. So non-coders can be really good at this documentation stuff for you. Um, they can also help you translate things into another language. We had a lot of translators working on Media Goblin, um, but it was because we didn't have that like, code is cool, like you have to come down here in the dungeon and hang out with us if you, you know, like, and everybody else stay out. Like we conscientiously con like encourage non-coders to contribute. Um, and, uh, and we worked hard to not have missing stairs. And that's a way of saying, like, someone who, uh, like, back channels people in the project, saying nasty stuff to them, or, like, constantly wants to talk about off topic but uncomfortable things in the IRC channel. Like, we were like, there's the door. You have to go. If you're going to, like, harass people in our IRC channel, you have to go. Um, and even if they were like, but I'm, I'm, like, writing all the code, and it's like, you can take your code, that's fine. Like, we, like, in my mind, for every person who is a prolific contributor but is scaring away other people from your project, you're, you're like, oh, but that, you're, you're thinking of, like, the, un, like, the uncontributed yet code versus one person. But if you looked at it over time, it's like, if that person drove out, like, 100 people from your channel, or your project, and even if only four of them turned out to be like half as productive as that person, you've already lost. And that's like, what if you could have kept like 10 of them? So, uh, so we were pretty hardline about that, and uh, we were pretty hardline about keeping it on topic and pleasant and non-personal in the, in the IRC channel, as far as like, you know, if you didn't like something, you could not call someone a name. Uh, I also think that uh, this one too, like, is it's kind of related. Like, um, when we glorify the people doing the most hours, like, uh, we we end up putting up with a lot of behavior where it's like, oh, well, of course, so and so is grumpy because they've been awake for like 16 hours. So then it's like now it's okay because someone's probably done eight hours of decent work, eight hours of crummy typo laden work, and now they get to harass other people who are contributing. So I think it's it has this other like sweet he coded till he fell asleep, like it it makes it also not it makes it. It's like, oh, that kind of contribution is way up here. And then it's like, oh, what if I'm in grad school and only have like 10 hours a week or two hours a week? You know, people in grad school are like, 10 hours a week? Like, OK, two hours a week to, uh, to contribute to a project. And like, you know, we need those folks. Like, we need a plurality of experiences and things for people to create software that can be used by a, a plurality of users. So. Um, so if you want your project to be like that, then you have to map it out. Like it doesn't just like, oh, we're not jerks. Like it'll probably, we'll probably just end up with not jerks. I actually told someone like, oh yeah, well, you know, this is some of how Media Goblin worked out. And they're like, oh wow, well of course, because you and Chris. And I'm like, oh no, we had conversations about it all the time to make sure it happened. So, so who isn't here yet? There are a lot of people who aren't here yet. It doesn't feel like that in here because the room is nice and full. Um, but there are a lot of people doing something else today, right? Um, they might even be like another activist meeting or another software meetup of some type. Um, but they aren't here. And so it can be hard to keep them in mind, right? Uh, so. Uh, before doing free software, one of the things that I used to do is political organizing. And so, we went, like, one year I went to a conference. I thought this was a good politician slide, right? <laughs> Um, but I went to this conference where we were talking about how to win elections. And it turns out, like, the way that you win elections, like, so you go to a conference with a bunch of people who care very deeply and passionately about the issues. And then you spend the entire time, hilariously, talking about the people in the middle who barely think about politics at all. Because that's how you win elections. You don't win elections by talking to the person who holds the exact opposite beliefs as you, because you're never going to bring that person over. You spend time thinking about, like, how do we reach people that are kind of like, eh, I don't know if I care about software. Like, because those are the unclaimed people. Like, or, um, yeah, 
I mean, privacy is cool. Like, those are the folks that could be brought in. The people who are already here, awesome. They're already here. Let's do what we can to not alienate them and send them away. And the people who are like, I love proprietary code. That's why I have six boats. Um, <laughs> we, we have a river here. I'd love to have a boat. Um, but anyway, like, so we're not going to win that person over. What we're going to win over is someone who's like, oh, I'm actually just kind of getting into this thing. Like, what's, what's the deal? I don't know if I... I don't know how I feel about free software. So those are the folks that we need to be thinking about and talking to on our frontline stuff. Like, we're not going to give them commit access to the kernel or whatever the day they arrive. But like, we can't just have them also show up at an empty storefront with a bunch of like go home newbies, like graffiti all over it either. So you know, it has to be. We have to think about like what our first impression is, and uh, and we can set the bar higher. Um, this is a Boeing airplane. Um, Garuda Indonesia has canceled their next order of Boeing airplanes um, because they want to not get the one without the new software. Um, so, uh, or you know, have no assurance that they won't get the one with the upgrades. So. Um, Again, this is a market niche. We could do like so much better than proprietary software. There is so much room there to be like, oh, we actually are honest with you. We actually like tell you what's going on. You can take a look at the code. Like, we're not out to screw you. Like, this is there's like so much that we could do that proprietary software has chosen not to. So by setting the bar higher as far as like our relationship to the users of our software and the people who contribute to it, like we, we could rise above, even without a nice waterfront conference center. So I'd like us to think of them as users and not customers, and maybe think, what could we offer them that they don't already have? Um, I don't have a pink pond, so um, you know. Uh, and it, it could be, it could look a little bit more like paradise. We, instead of being like, oh, I hate spreadsheets, it could be like, oh, these are great spreadsheets. And calc is pretty good. You know, so like, we don't have to tie ourselves to just replicating the proprietary version. We could make something that is even more awesome. And then finally, the kids. Uh, this is like what you call a recursive meme. Um, how do you do, fellow kids? But it's also a five-year-old meme, so how do you do, fellow kids? Um, <laughs> so we're going to need the kids. Um, the future looks kind of dark. Like, I don't know if you've noticed, the economy's kind of in the toilet. Like, it's not a lot of optimism. So, uh, you know, again, like, another market niche. Like, proprietary software has chosen to just be like, just work 16 hours, uh, you know, on surveillance software. That's awesome. And kids are like, I'd rather not. So we, we could offer something else. Um, and not, like, come to San Francisco and sleep in a bunk bed. Um, like, we could, we could choose to build code not in San Francisco. We could also build code there. Um, you know, but, like, really, truly embrace creating uh, companies and services and communities that are in places that are affordable to live. Um, so, you know, the world, the world is ours. We can go wherever we want. Nobody is making it a rule that we have to just replicate proprietary software with all of the other crappy stuff. So, it's work, right? So there's homework. Where to start? Um, again, we cannot have the, the crap on the mailing list and we can't have the Nazis like, we're not winning if we've like completely, there is not a utopia we can build that is like okay for Nazis. There just isn't. Um, we can look at some of the barriers to entry and see if we can move those out of the way. Uh, stop doing pedestals for coders and leaving everybody else who's actually meeting the user and getting folks to come and actually file bugs and uh, make it look nice for stuff to use. Um, you know, and not leaving people out in the lurch like, oh, good luck with that. <laughs> you installed our thing. <laughs> like, um, and the, the licenses aren't enough. And I say this as a person who just organized an entire day-long conference about copyleft. Like, I care deeply about copyleft. But it's not enough. If we don't build communities that people want to be part of, then it is not going to be enough. So, um, I guess think about that in your own communities and where you might, uh, where you might be able to make some progress. 
Uh, I have picture credits, and then I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you. If you have questions, just come on down to the microphone. Oh, I have an announcement while you think of your questions. Um, one of the projects we run at Conservancy is Outreachy, which is a paid internship to work on free software for three months. You get 5,500 bucks, um, and the applications are open now. I don't, you all look young to me, but even if you're not, if you're not intern age, and you can be any age for our internships, perhaps consider finding the Outreachy or the Conservancy on social media and resharing that to, to the kids. Um, because uh, getting paid to work on free software is a very easy way to get in. So, um, do people have questions, comments? Oh, yeah, please come on down. Hi, I'm really nervous up here because I, I just know so little about this stuff. Um, what is Media Goblin? What is an IRC channel? And how do I get involved? Awesome. Those are all great questions. So Media Goblin is decentralized media hosting uh, designed to replace like YouTube and Flickr and other media hosting services, but instead of being organized around the media type, it's organized around the user. And it's federated similar to like how Mastodon is. So instead of being one massive company, your stuff goes in and then goes back out to your friends who've formed nodes. Uh, IRC is an internet relay channel, which is uh, a cheap and free and uh, like low footprint way to do chat online. And you can access it through a web browser too. If you, uh, there are a couple of different programs, but if you don't want to jump right to that, you can find IRC uh, on a web browser. And then how do you get involved? It depends on what you want to get involved with. Um, but you know, uh, I would say find something that is perhaps adjacent to some of your existing interests or adjacent to something that you're interested in learning about. Um, another good thing to do is to look at the list of projects that participate in Outreachy, the internship program I mentioned, because those are all really friendly projects that are used to bringing in new people. I, I guess I just wondered if there's a place I could go, like here, I, I'm local, so can oh, I go yeah. to the office and say, hey, I want to do, I'm really interested in activism, so, yeah. or writing or something, so. Yeah. Place I can go to do that? Yeah. Um, so I, there has been a free desktop meetup in the Boston area for a while, um, and so that's a good one. There's also a, like a really good Python meetup. Um, as far as one that specifically involves activism, I'm not totally certain, but there. Um, I'll see if I can find some ideas. Yeah, I do. I work from home, so I do all my stuff remote. But yeah, awesome. Thank you. If anybody has any questions and doesn't want to come down, I can bring you a microphone as well. Um, so this uh, topic really interests me. Um, I didn't know or care necessarily about free software like five years ago, yeah. um, until five years ago. Um, um, but um, I became interested in it. I'm a musician. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, when I first visited FSF, they said, oh, this is interesting. This is in reach, because I went to their office first. Okay. Um, but uh, it's been an incredible journey for me. Um, I eventually started working with Walter Bender, and mm -hmm. we made uh, a visual programming language for music. So I like awesome. this idea of being imaginative, mm -hmm. um, working with other groups of people, and not necessarily replacing what there already is, but really thinking outside of the box to make something even better. So I just... Yeah. No, and Sugar is a fantastic yeah. example of that. Um, we, and, and they're actually a conservancy project too. Yes. Um, we, this year, or in the past year, welcomed on Microblocks, which is another one that doesn't have a proprietary uh, version. It's, it is, um, it's like uh, programming for kids on uh, little devices. So they make little blinky jewelry or, uh, we just uh, we just found a video of kids using it in Spain, and they made um, a little box that smiles when it's quiet, and then makes a frowny face when it's noisy. <laughs> and then and they all glued like pom poms and glitter and stickers all over it. And then we're like talking to the it was adorable. And and it's all free software, uh, and it talks to this hardware stuff. And 
um, and it talks to all different kinds of hardware. So there's like a lot of great projects like that. I didn't mean to make it sound like there aren't any, but. And then a plus one for, you know, outreach to kids because mm -hmm. they're really the future. So if we don't really invest in them, we're not going to really get anywhere. Yeah, we are not going to be here forever. Yeah. Um, hi, so I don't really know how to put this into words exactly, um, but one of the things that, that I've struggled with in talking about trying to make the community uh, more accepting mm -hmm. is this conundrum between wanting to make sure that we make it acceptable for new people that are coming in and make sure that they find a home here. And at the same time, you also have people that are here that are obnoxious, abrasive, whatever, mm -hmm. and, and you know, do you, do you drive those people away in order to try and make the environment better for new people? At the same time, um, you know, we, we need to make a place for those people as well. That is, that, that I, I was involved in a group where there was a person with mental illness, and, and a bunch of people wanted to push that person out because they did things that made them uncomfortable. And at the same time, there was a, a, a mental illness professional um, in our group who said, you really have to accept that if you're going to have a diverse, inclusive community, that people are going to behave in ways that make you uncomfortable. And so you have to go into that intentionally and say, yes, we understand this person's behavior may make us uncomfortable, but yet we're going to make a space for that person in the community. And so this is a conundrum. I mean, I get that we want to try and say no Nazis because I think you know intolerance is the one thing that we must not tolerate. Yeah. But do you, is, I don't know if that's... Yeah, it does get a little sticky, and I'm not saying that you should never feel uncomfortable. I mean, it's... Uh, and and that's, that's actually a really good example. Um, I think it's, I would always recommend like, a, like what you would, what, you, what might be termed as calling in before you do calling out. Like I know it's very, you get more clicks or whatever, time on social media, blah, 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 if you call people out when they miss stuff. Um, but I am a huge fan of calling in to say like, hey, it looks like you're trying to have like a welcoming project that isn't all men, but then when you announce a mustache growing contest, it doesn't come across like that. So I don't know if you meant for that or you just were talking about mustaches and thought they were funny. Like, but it doesn't send the message that you hope it would. So like that kind of like, I think when people are trying and just no. Oh, whoops! I didn't think of that. Um, it's uh, so the calling in is a good one. I do also think like um, you know sussing out like oh is someone like like uh, sometimes people bring children and we can't we can't say we want new people and then be like you can't have the noise of children at your event. You just can't. Like, so those are things, but like, I don't think babies are like, oh, I hate this speaker, like, Rrr, you know? So, so I think the intention does matter a little bit. Like when people mean well, if you tell them the intention didn't come across, then they should want to change the behavior. Um, if they don't mean well, or they didn't mean anything because they're an infant, like, then, you know, then that's stuff we, we put up with. Like, like oh, I, I need to sit in the front, or I gotta, like, I need everyone to shout because I'm going a little deaf or something, and it's like, does that make meetings as relaxing as they could be? No, but we do have to make room. But I think if the intention is like, I want to be able to, as part of my participation in this project, make other people feel small and crummy. Like, we can't make room for that. So, I think we've got time for maybe one more question and then I'll let y'all. Yeah, cool. Um, so you talked about uh, what uh, you and Christopher Weber did for Media Goblin to like intentionally make it mm -hmm. more uh, inclusive. Mm -hmm. uh, have you guys are published a blog or anything else that will help someone else trying to follow your footsteps? Mm, that's interesting. Um, we're going to a meta of the meta. I mean, we did often talk about it on the blog in little bits and pieces, but we didn't collate it as a like here are 20 things we did over the course of a couple years to really try hard to make it inclusive. Um, but that's an interesting idea. I might accept that patch. <laughs> okay. Any other, anything else? A quick one, or, or we're good. I'll be here for the rest of the day too. So if you want to ask me something not in the room, that's also fine. Something nice. Thank you. Thank you.